I am Phil Borman, Chief Administrator for Holy Family Catholic Schools. I'll be co-presenting today with Todd Wessels, who is a principal but also is a, a lead in personalized learning support for the upcoming year. Our agenda will begin with prayer and kind of go through how we got here in the first place to give you a backdrop, but then um, give you an overview, talk to you about the support for personalized learning, um, how we're implementing here at Holy Family Catholic Schools, and, and of course answering your questions. All right. So if you would pray with me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, thank you for the beauty and majesty we see in your creation. Thank you for the opportunity to care for the world you have made. We ask that your blessing would rest on our community, that you would give us great vision and enthusiasm for our work. Please bless the efforts of our minds, the bonds between us, and the influence of our work for Holy Family Catholic Schools and beyond. Lord, as we plan and share together now, may you guide us by your Holy Spirit and lead us into all truth. Amen. Thank you. Personalized learning kind of came to Holy Family, and for some people it felt like it was here and now, right, in the immediacy. For others who had been working on the back end of it, it's taken us years to get here. And so that, start, that journey started basically with a simple purpose. Um, we had gotten together after seeing the discrepancy within the classroom at every grade level was so wide and vast that we wanted to make headway in changing that. Like we could, we believe that we could serve students better. And so I tell the people that in this seventh grade class a few years ago, I was working with a particular family who whose child had so many struggle, had so many special needs, right? Academic concerns where there are several grade levels be, um, below in their in their reading. They had other things that were, you know, behavioral things. And, and, and so at the end of this, like throughout this year, and trying to serve them with all that we have, and we have a, a terrific support system, we felt like we could no longer serve them at our school. And then in that very same classroom, we had a student who was writing, not her first, but her second novel, right, who, who has come to us with so many gifts. And they're sitting in the same language arts class, right, receiving instruction. We thought, wow, like, we've come a long way in, in, in technology and in education, yet so many things that we're doing hasn't changed. And so we grabbed a team together to say, hey, how can we rethink how education is delivered? right like what would we do if we could start from scratch and let's put together something that we could put forth and complement our existing programming so this is that team up here uh, a team I'm extremely proud of proud for um, they are three high school teachers three middle school teachers, um, counselor, uh, the high school principal, middle school principal, um, and, and so there's 10 of us, right, who gave up their prep time, gave up their other time to meet every week regularly to study what would we do. And we came up with, you know, we, we created a lens for how we're doing things and we came up with four priorities, right? We thought that if we are going to do this, we, we'd personalize learning. I thought that was the crux of it, right? How to meet that, that vast gap in, in what kids able to do. We want to be able to leverage technology differently, right? It has grown since when we were, we were in school. We want to make sure also that we had community partners, that we were going out into our community, our kids were going out into the community and having these rich experiences, but also that we would invite the community in here for Holy Family Catholic Schools. But we also said, let's make it comprehensive. If we're going to do this work, let's not make it a, a special middle school program or, or this junior, senior year type thing, but that, that would be 612 comprehensive. And so that took a whole lot of work. Um, this group broke into four groups, and we studied the East Coast, West Coast, Mountain, and Midwest for who's doing best in the country like that was the line we're not going to study you know a, a mediocre system but we wanted to find people who had our same values our same vision and who are doing it excellently got it down to 20 schools tremendous experience learning about them by the way and then every group pitched their number one school that they felt like hey we're going to travel, we're going to research them, we're going to study them. Every group pitched. Summit was one of those schools. 
Um, it was on the West Coast group. I was not a part of that team. As a matter of fact, um, I was East Coast. I had a whole other school I thought was, was, was tremendous. But um, all said and done, this is what we came up with. We came up with um, Summit Learning. We chose Summit at the time because they envisioned a comprehensive approach to education. They had 15 years, at, the, at that point, they had 15 years of experience. And we were impressed that not only were they an excellent school, but they were in some respects world renowned, some of the things that they were doing. Third party assessed and winning some major awards. They were also kicking out kids who had access to four year college at a higher rate than any other school, in the, um, arguably any other school in the country, right? Because they're at the 98 to 100% of, of acceptance rate for all their kids going into four year schools, right? This is the kind of work they're doing. We also recognize the diversity of the students they served. This comprehensive program was being put in front of people who, who, who were minority students, who had special needs, where a significant amount of the population had those needs, and they were achieving at high levels. And then they're in schools where they're elite institutions, right? They're these people who it took cost forty, fifty, and sixty thousand dollars to attend a year at some of these institutions using the same type of approach. And why did that work? Is because they knew how to take a new learning model and apply it specifically to their communities. And they were having tremendous success. So we thought, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to try this out. We're going to study it. We were going to go visit them. They said, we're not taking visitors. We're kind of getting late in the game. They said, but you could go travel up to Minneapolis. We have a school up there, a partner school. And, and they also said that um, in the midst of our conversation and study that we could become partners if we'd like. No one else in Iowa had been doing it. No one knew about it, I mean, perhaps. So we went and found Summit. Summit had agreed, we had applied, and that was the kickoff. Um, we had, basically our go number was 25 students. If we could get 25 students to sign up in sixth grade that we would partner and go for it. We did have some um, folks who said, yeah, we'll do that. And that was kind of the start of our summer experience. Now, the thing that, again, we talked about what impressed us, we talked about their experience and their backstory, having 15 plus years of experience and in partnering and leveraging things. But Summit's very easy to talk about in education. Those who know education and study education, and if you go into, um, from a, you'll see later how, from the state of Iowa and they, what they want for our schools, but to the colleges and what they're expecting for their graduates to be able to do. Um, their alignment to the research for how kids learn and what kids need is incredible, right? Imagine a system that wasn't just born out of its, you know, what we've done the previous year kind of mentality. But they said, no, how do kids learn? What's the research say? And let's apply that to how we approach education. And so all of these partners up here are people who have a concerted impact on how comprehensive the system is. So you will talk later about the scale program. In front of you, you have the 36 cognitive skills. That's where they came from, right? Stanford's research on what kids need to be able in life to succeed and live a fulfilled life. Um, you're gonna see that for the Center for Education and Policy Research, they went to Harvard to find the best policy research there was. Um, Yale, they looked for the habits of success. That's in front of you as well. So Yale's kick out and research on what kids need to be successful beyond just the skills. Like what it means to be connected and, and to feel supported. Um, that's where that comes from, right? They're partnering with our ACT um, schools, right? Um, they're the Buck Institute, which is a forerunner in project-based learning. All of these things are what creates the opportunities that our kids are having here at Holy Family Catholic Schools. Now, elementary, some questions were, well, how did elementary come to be a part of personalized learning? So the story here is like we have got 25 kids that started this out, they selected in, everyone else went into the traditional route. That next year, we gave the choice again. We said, hey, we wanted to get 50 students involved in personalized learning for year two. That was the goal. If we could get 50, that would be awesome, right? Um, because we knew the class coming in was pretty big. It was about 130 students. We had an overwhelming response. We were prepared for uh, initially. Right? And over 75 kids want to do personalized. 
I said, okay, we can make that happen. We didn't, it worked well on the schedule. Uh, ended up being 80 students year coming into personalized learning. So we had 80 kids in personalized learning, 50 kids in traditional. We felt like this was excellent. A lot of energy, a lot of excitement from year one. At the same time, within that same year as we were kind of discerning this out, elementary had grabbed a group too. They had a consultant come in. They're looting, they were really uh, leading their own group and they wanted to study instructional models too. Quickly, personalized learning jumped to the top of the page. Anyone in, every, anyone in education right now should be moving toward a personalized learning approach. We know too much about how kids learn and how different and unique they are and how their gifts de you know, depend on where they're coming from and, and, and where they've been to not try this out, right? This batch, one size fits all approach is no longer appropriate in education. And so they wanted personalized learning too. And they decided, you know, in their work that it made sense because Summit had also had a fourth and fifth grade experience, but they would jump in to do that and stay aligned with what was going to happen for 612. So that's how they came to be in that, in that decision. So you can kind of see the implementation plan here I was speaking about earlier. That sixth grade had 25 students here. That's that first class. In the second, in 2018-19, this previous school year, we had grades four, five, six, seven, nine. It was the first year that high school jumped in. That was a strategy part, part on the secondary level. We said, we'll go sixth grade, start small with 25, then we go six, seven, nine, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, was the original plan on through. Ninth grade did a tremendous job. They actually had 41 students participate in personalized learning in its first year. Um, this is their second year coming up for the 2019-20 school year. I think their enrollment's at 60 students who had selected, we want personalized learning in high school. Again, we're now going over half of the incoming freshman class choosing to do personalized learning. And you can see over time that by 22, 23, that we will be fully implemented for 12 is, is the scope of that. So I've led you through a, a, a big part of this, where it came from piece. Ty Wessel is gonna, is gonna talk to you more about the nuts and bolts of personalized learning, going through some things um, intentionally fast. Uh, we want to make sure we're making time for your, your questions uh, toward the end, but he'll do that. Also recognize that when we're talking about personalized learning and four pillars, we're speaking to the four core classes. We're talking about your social studies class, your English class, your science class, and your math class. But we're not speaking to our Spanish class, elective course offerings, you know, specialist courses such as PE and art. So in your mind, be thinking about your, your core ex class experience, okay? Um, I am principal at Holy Ghost. I also work with all of our schools um, on curriculum and especially with our, our um, PL implementation. Um, across the system. As I present this afternoon, I want you to know I also have a little bit of a unique perspective because um, in addition to being the system curriculum guy, principal at Holy Ghost, last year I taught fourth and fifth grade math on the platform so I got to experience this as a teacher as well and my son Max is part of that first group of 25 so I also have a parent perspective of two years in the program how it's affected um, Max and his education. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the four, the four pillars, um, content knowledge, cognitive skills, habits of, habits of success, and faith in action. And as I talk about those, those are the pillars from Summit Learning or the platform that we use, but we have made them uniquely our own here at Holy Family. So the, the philosophy um, comes from Summit, but we have customized them to our needs for students within the Holy Family system. One critical aspect of personalized learning is mentoring. All students in personalized learning, and we're expanding that at the middle school level and at some of our elementary sites as well, have 
a mentor and they are guaranteed each week a 10 minute mentoring session a time where they sit down with their mentor and set their goals for the week discuss the previous week you know the conversation always starts off with what's your high and what's your low for the week so what went well what maybe didn't go well the mentor looks at their data from the platform has a discussion about how they should be planning out their week you know sometimes the discussions really vary um, if it's the beginning of baseball season they've got lots of practice the discussion becomes around habits and planning and how can a student um, plan out when they're going to do their work if they're really struggling with one um, content area but are flying in another um, the discussion is how do you balance your time how do you make sure that you're um, getting everything done in all four of your core areas so mentoring is an incredibly valuable time it's one of those times that um, the kids really look forward to in fact this past year with our whole winter vortex and change in schedules and one day school weeks um, students were always wondering are we still having mentoring this week even if it was the only day of school so students are looking forward to that mentoring time they seek out their mentor um, for the mentoring time and one of the things that we talk about during uh, mentoring time are what are called the habits of success these are the um, the skills that students need to be successful in school and really to be successful in life um, there's 16 social um, social skills that really work their way up the pyramid we start with healthy development and what are those skills that students need just to live a healthy lifestyle and we work our way up to independence and sustainability but along the way we're having those discussions about what does it mean to have a growth mindset how do you um, bounce back from when you have a failure if you fail on a, on a content assessment how do you learn from that how do you use that to help you grow and help you to be better these are things that we um, always have known are good for kids but we haven't necessarily directly taught students so now as part of our personalized learning we're, def we're definitely teaching them those skills we're teaching them how to organize themselves how to plan how to set goals how to set smart goals what is, you know, for in some cases, it's what is a smart goal? You know, how are they making them goal, their goals for themselves? So those are the 16 habits of success. And we don't just talk about them in mentoring time. We talk about them throughout the day. And they're really part of the overall discussion that goes on. But mentoring is when we hone in on those with students one-on-one. -on -one. The next part of personalized learning is what we call project time. Project time is based around those 36 cognitive skills that are on the handout you received. And we have project time in all four of the core um, subject areas. Math looks a little bit different. Um, we call them concept units and portfolio problems, but essentially they're that same project time. They're that real world learning. How do you take the skills, how do you take that knowledge, that content knowledge, that you know and then apply it to real world situations and the cognitive skills as mr. Borman mentioned are based on um, the scale center at Stanford and they have done lots of research about what skills do students need to be um, successful in school and in college and beyond so whether they're going directly from high school to um, college or directly from high school into a career what are the skills that transcend all subject areas? So we may score these cognitive skills in English and in science and then again in social studies over the course of the year because they're skills that are not um, subject dependent. They're skills that are in, um, across all subject levels. So students will have an opportunity to demonstrate their abilities in these skills in each subject area. So you have the, the handout in front of you, because um, this is a little small, but you can see how they're broken, broken into um, the different categories and how those um, skills would apply across the curriculum. The real um, benefit of us doing this in a four through, eventually four through 12th grade system is these skills each are attached to a scoring rubric that the students will 
on as fourth graders and they'll build on those skills all throughout the program until they reach the college level um, aspect of the rubric. So a student who scores a three at the fourth grade level is on track. But it, that same rubric, that same skill is looking at the students so as they, their expectation goes up each grade level of what, what score they get on the rubric. Also the benefit of these being cross-curricular, um, cross cross-subjects, if a student demonstrates in social studies that they're working at a 4.5 level on a certain COG skill, their English teacher is going to be able to see that data. So they're not going to accept a 3 work or a 3.5 work if the student's already demonstrated that they can do um, better work. So we're always looking at those cognitive skills with the students and how can they improve their projects and improve their um, work. So here's an example of what uh, the final product of a seventh grade project, and I realize this is small, so I'll read you what the final product is, and this is in seventh grade geology. Students are going to develop and illustrate a comic book to visualize the inferred development of your ge geological formation. So what students have to do in this project is pick a geological formation. So maybe they're picking the Rocky Mountains. And then they have to use their creativity to make a comic book to explain how the Rocky Mountains were formed. So from, from the beginning until today, how would they demonstrate that? So if you think about all that students have to know and all of the knowledge that they have to be able to present to you in that comic book, but they're also using their creativity along the way. Instead of just making a poster that says in 2000 BC it looked like this and in zero it looked like this and it, you know and, and through the years but they're making that comic book um, to present the information and then the students are also given well, what are they going to be scored on? Which of those cognitive skills? So this particular final product is scored on modeling, on making connections and inferences, constructing an evidence-based explanation, and selection of evidence. So those are the key skills that the teacher is going to look at, along with the content, to make sure that the content is accurate. But when they score their project, so it's not just um, regurgitating some content that they read in a book or something is putting it together in a, in a creative way and presenting it. And this is just one example of a final product. Sometimes final products are something creative like a comic book. Sometimes it's a writing. Sometimes it's a speech. At um, my school last year, it was great to see our fifth graders were all giving speeches about the American Revolution. And that, that was something new for fifth graders, to select evidence and put together their persuasive speeches. They were acting as a column trying to convince um, somebody else to join the revolution so they had to understand the aspects of the American Revolution and why you would want to be um, part of the revolution versus being uh, siding with the British. It was, it was great to see fifth graders really digging in to that in-depth process. And then they were scored not only on their, their content knowledge, but also on their ability to put together a speech and their presentation skills and so on. So the final products for projects are presented in a number of different ways. It gives the students all sorts of ways to present their um, knowledge and their, present their knowledge of the cog cognitive skills. The next aspect or the next pillar is the content knowledge. And this is probably what we're most familiar with in education. We learn the facts. This is where we learn the facts. And what, what research has told us is the most effective way to learn facts is not by a teacher standing up in front of the room and lecturing. It's giving, kids, it's giving students opportunities to explore different resources, to teach them how to take notes, and so that they can gather the information and learn the content. So content is presented to the students in a series of what are called power focus areas. And the way I like to think of power focus areas, if you think of your social studies textbook, a traditional social studies textbook, each power focus area is a chapter. 
starts off with the students are given a diagnostic tests. So what do they already know? That pretest. Then they're presented with here are the objectives for this power focus area. Here's what you have to know. So there's a skill right there that we have to teach students is how do we take objectives, educational objectives, and write them into student-friendly language that are questions that they can figure out, well, what do I need to know um, at the end of this power focus area? So one of the things that we teach students right away at the beginning of the year and what we call onboarding is how to take those objectives and write those into questions so that when they're um, using notes from videos or from articles or um, online presentations or maybe it's from a chapter in a traditional textbook, how are they answering those objective questions? Um, one of the amazing things again is students are taught different skills, different strategies for taking notes. So we had fourth and fifth graders in all of our sites who were taking Cornell notes. And I know personally myself, I learned how to take Cornell notes when I was in graduate school. It wasn't something that I learned as a fourth grader. So they were learning these very distinct skills on how to take notes and whether it was from a, uh, whatever the source was, they were able to take high quality notes um, to learn the, the content. So once the students um, take the diagnostic test, figure out what they need to know, they have um, a number of resources provided for them that they can use to answer those objective questions to, figure, to learn the content for this um, power focus area. When they feel they're ready, that they, they're ready to show that they've mastered the content, they go to their teacher and have a conversation, show them their notes or what, um, what they did to learn this content. And the teacher, if it looks like they did enough work, that they weren't just um, scribbling down random letters or things on their paper, will allow them to take what's called the content assessment. The content assessments consist of 10 questions that they have to get at least eight correct on. Okay, so you might think, well, that's pretty easy. 10 multiple choice questions. If I'm taking the American Revolution, it's probably questions like, who's the first president? You know, we'd all get that one right. <laughs> questions are not quite that easy. The questions, even though they're multiple choice, are very um, complex questions. So here's an example of a question in fifth grade science. Claire and Mike conduct an experiment in which they dissolve three different white colored mystery powders in water and then observe and weigh the final product. Based on the data in the table below, which mystery powder caused the chemical reaction? So if you think about that question, that is a very high level question for students. They have to know the difference between a chemical reaction and a physical change. They have to know what would the um, byproduct of a chemical reaction be. And then to analyze the data from four different experiments to decide which one is demonstrating a chemical reaction. And in this case, it happens to be um, experiment B. So this is just one example of the rigor of the questions in the content um, tests that the students take. So I don't want you to think they're just getting by taking some easy multiple choice questions. They're very rigorous questions um, across the curriculum, whether it's in science in this case, social studies, um, English, or um, the math portion of their personalized learning. Those content assessments are challenging for them. So students take the content assessment. If they get an eight out of 10, they pass and they're able to move on to the next power focus area. But if they get the dreaded seven, seven is like a bad word in a personalized learning classroom. Um, if they get the dreaded seven or below, they have not shown mastery, so they have to go back and continue to uh, research and to learn those objectives. Maybe go to a workshop offered by their teacher. Um, one of the resources that it will be given to them is if students choose after they score either a 9 or a 10 on the content assessment, they can be listed in the platform as a resource to go to. So for some students, they love that. They want their peers to come to them and they can peer tutor. Other students say they'll get that option, they'll check that off. Nope, I don't want to work with anybody, um, so my name's not going to be listed. But 
if they get that seven or below, they go back and they do some more research or go to a workshop with the teacher, um, like I said. And then each teacher has their, um, their norms or their requirements of what do they have to do to take this assessment a second time. Um, many times it show the teacher 10 more notes or five more notes or practice problems if it's math or you know, they have requirements. So once the student shows them that they've, they've done that, then they are given the opportunity to take the assessment again. So each time students take the assessment, there is a requirement that they go back and do work on those objectives so that they're truly mastering the work. And now you, you might think, okay, well, but if they get the same 10 questions again, they just have to figure out which ones they got wrong. Each power focus area has a question bank of somewhere between 40 and 70 questions. So they're getting a random set of questions each time they take it. So they're not getting the same assessment each time based on the same objectives, but not the same questions each time. So once they, um, once they show mastery, whether it's on the first time they've taken it or the third time, um, then they move on to the next power focus area. There's a different number of power focus areas for each, um, each subject area, um, but I'll show you in a few minutes how track where they're at as they go through the year. Can I ask a question? How do grades work then? So if a student says, I really want to get an A in social studies, does that mean you have to get 90 or 100% on every content assessment? Grades are based, based on mastery. It's, it's kind of a complicated formula, but um, in the summit program, um, and we'll go over more of this individually at school sites with our um, parent onboarding um, sessions, but 70% of their grade is based on their project grade. 21% is based on their what are called their power focus areas. So did they master the power focus areas? And then 9% of their grade is based on what are called additional um, focus areas. Areas. So those are the um, above and beyond, above and beyond the standard um, curriculum for that grade level. So they go more in depth um, with particular um, focus areas. Do they get to find out the correct answer to the ones they missed? No. They find out which objectives, oh, she asked, did they, do they get to find out the answers or the questions that they miss. They find out which objectives they miss questions on, but not the actual question. So they'll see if there's two objectives for that power focus area, they may see that they got three out of five on objective one and four out of five on objective two. So they need to do a little more work on objective one. Okay. So the next part of personalized learning is where we put it all together. And in Holy Family, that's what we call our faith in action. So it's taking our content, it's taking our real world problems that we've done in project time, and how do we use that to reach out beyond our classroom? How do, we, how do, how do our students use that to be good, good citizens, good parishioners? How, do, how are we using God's given um, gifts to go above and beyond our classroom? So in Faith in Action, we have a number of different ways that we, sh we showed this last year. And here's just a few examples. We had students who um, put together some natural resource projects and shared those with um, the mayor and some people from the, the city council. We had students who were working um, with their faith and they got, um, went on a tour of the cathedral and had an opportunity to ask some in-depth questions of Father Allen when they were there. Um, this, this project I'm particularly familiar with because it happened to be a seventh grade math project that my son was involved in. Um, if you know, there's, there's lots of murals in Duke, and so one of the murals that they were, they hadn't yet painted and they have now, um, they had to develop the scale. So they started off with the picture and the dimensions of the building and had to take that picture and expand it. So how would they paint that on the building? That was an example of one of the portfolio problems that they did in their math class. So Faith in Action is that opportunity for our students to, to reach out beyond the class. 
working with our older students, our high school students, how do we set them up with mentoring or um, internship opportunities, so where they're looking at for their career, um, for internship opportunities. At our middle and high school, um, our middle school level, our students have gone out on, on field trips, they've gone to um, water treatment plant to learn about water processing and how that relates to their science. So it's really looking beyond our classroom in our faith in action. So all of that put together is housed in what's called the Summit Learning Platform, or what we often refer to as just the platform. The platform is a learning management system. Um, you may have experienced a learning management system, something like Google Classroom. Um, we use a lot in our classrooms in Holy Family. At the college level, something called Moodle or Blackboard. It's just a place where all of the curriculum is housed. The beauty of the Summit platform for us is it houses our student, the curriculum, but it also for our teachers houses that data. So they're able to, at a glance, quickly look at how are students doing in each subject area, who do I need to pull in and work with a small group today that is struggling with a particular power focus area. Um, it allows our students to have one place where they go, so all of their resources for the class are located in the platform. They don't have to go out and search Google. Um, for the resources, they're all there in the platform for them. They can look and see how are they doing in classes right on the platform. They don't have to open up PowerSchool and, and check there. So the platform is the place where all of the learning is organized. What you probably hear a lot of is about the blue line. What I hear from students is about the blue line. The blue line is essentially today's date. And it moves across the calendar incrementally and shows the students where do they need to be to be keeping pace, to be done with all of their um, power focus areas at the end of the year. So this middle line here, these are all the power focus areas. And when they're green, that means the students have shown mastery on them. If they turn red, it means that the line is passed and they have not yet shown mastery on them. So this student here is doing a good job of keeping up. But this um, student, when they meet with their mentor, their mentor would probably have a conversation with them about where are you at in science? Are you working on weather and climate? Because that line is in weather and climate right now and is going to pass in a few days. If the student says, no, I'm working on English because I really like English, that would be a great opportunity for the mentor to say, yeah, you like English and that's great, but look at your blue line. You're ahead of, you're ahead of the game in English. You've got one power focus area to spare. So let's, let's, let's buckle down and work on weather and climate climate this week, set some goals around that. So that's the kind of conversation that would go on with a student and their mentor in looking at their platform. Now when we talk about um, pacing in personalized learning, students are in control of their pacing for their power focus areas. So what they're working on and how they're moving through um, the power focus areas. The class as a whole is working on projects. So the whole class will be pacing on the projects at the same time. So they'll be moving through the projects. The projects are all aligned to the power focus areas so that students are using the content that they've learned in their project. But the projects are paced out by the class, by the teacher. So at the beginning of the class period each day, the teacher uh, will like a very traditional classroom, tell them what they're going to work on today. Sometimes there'll be whole group instruction, sometimes it might be small group instruction, sometimes they might be working on one aspect of their final product and they might be working in small groups, they might be working as individuals. The one thing I want you to know about our projects in personalized learning is students are all graded independently because we've probably all been part of that project, whether it was in school or, or in work, where one person did all the work and everybody else got all the credit, or one person did none of the work and everybody else got all of the blame. It's not that way in personalized learning. Even if students are working in small groups on their checkpoints or on, on their final products, they're all required to turn in their own final products. So they're all graded individually on those skills. So it's not a group grade, 
it's always an individual grade. As we look at um, Summit and we look at the Summit platform, it's been an ever-increasing community of schools that are using Summit. This map is actually from last summer um, and shows all of the schools that are using um, the Summit platform. Um, they will have an updated map after the summer's training, but they said they don't update the map until all schools have completed training. You don't get to go on the, on the map um, because they have a very strict requirement for training for all the teachers and administrators in the program. But as uh, really across the country. There's actually three more schools in Iowa now that are using the Summit platform as well. But it's a real community of schools and sharing of information and sharing of successes and what works well um, among teachers. As we look at personalized learning as a whole and other initiatives that are going around the state, the Iowa Department of Education and the Iowa Colleges have developed the Iowa Colleges and Career definition and I think they must have looked up Holy Family to see what we were doing and then they wrote theirs or we just were on the same page when we're looking at research um, but our initiatives with personalized learning align up directly with the Iowa um, Department of Education and their college readiness skills so as we develop those cognitive skills those habits of success and the content knowledge we continue to um, align with the other initiatives in the state. We wanted to give you, um, hear some voices from, from some parents. And so we have a new video that we partnered with Loris College to put together, which is um, the voices from a few of our parents about personalized learning and about their student success. So we'll um, watch this short video and then we'll have an opportunity for question and answer um, after that. A part of me being skeptical about the program was just kind of listening to chatter outside of these kids are just gonna sit and rot in front of a computer. And I thought, oh my gosh, my son's gonna be like surfing the internet while he's supposed to be doing science. This is the one thing I would say going in, well, when do the teachers teach? I mean, if my kid's just gonna be on a laptop teaching himself. We actually weren't sure if we were going to have our son take part in personalized learning. We talked about it for a long time. He was doing just fine in traditional learning and we were happy with that. I was very scared. My son has struggled since preschool and when they introduced this new personalized learning, I thought, there's no way. Because he's not succeeding in the regular classroom, he'll never succeed with this type of learning. My husband and I talked about why have we chosen Holy Family, and we've chosen Holy Family for many reasons, faith formation, character development, and academics. So we thought, well, let's give this a shot. We owe it to our kids to give it a shot. I think it really dawned on me the first time I went in and observed, and I thought, oh, that's not anything what I thought it looked like. If you're coming in my room, you're seeing me walking around, kneeling by desks, taking maybe a small group over to the side. Everyone's being pulled into different groups with me all the time, so it isn't like just the slower learners go with Mrs. Trees or just the faster learners go with Mrs. Trees. Everyone goes with me at some point. That's the beauty of personalized. Before this came along, the students that were learning at a high rate, I didn't challenge them enough, and the students that were learning at a low rate, I didn't give them enough assistance. In this situation, all three tiers of those students are met. This management system is a tool for us. Just like we don't decide, okay, we have this new math textbook, we go point by point. The teacher has the flexibility to be using it as their students need it. Do they utilize laptops? Yes. We should utilize technology. What a great way to enhance education. I used to have to ride my bike to the library, use the card catalog. They have access to this stuff, so now they have this data, what can they do with it? The world around us is changing. It isn't how it was when we grew up. And for our kids to be able to learn how to process information in this world and be confident in that, then we feel confident in personalized learning and where it's gonna take our kids in the future. I saw him really take off and care about what he was learning. And look, mom, I'm out of the red. I'm now in the green. And my goals, and I thought, goals? You've never said goals before. You know, your goal was always just to get through the day. I just, I couldn't be 
happier and I am so glad that we chose to stick it out. I'm excited for next year to kind of see what the next level of personalized learning will be for him and how much more he can grow. As a parent, this is hard. I know, I'm a parent of three. This system has worked for all students this year. It meets every learner's needs where they are, and it's such a gift to your child to get this experience of personalized learning. And I hope that they will trust us to let us take their child on that journey.